Hi, good evening, guys. Welcome to the early, early show with Lata Srinivasan. Uh, this Friday evening, um, I think all of you are looking forward to the weekend to just chilling out. Um, and I see that uh, Sushit Varghese has already joined me. I hope you guys are uh, excited about this chat. I'm just adding him in a second. Um, just hold on. Da -da. Hi, hi, Sonal. A lot of my friends are coming on. It's lovely to see you guys. Let me just add Sujit. So I've just sent a request. Hi, Sonal. Hi, hi, Sujit. Is this working? Absolutely. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so, firstly, thank you so much for accepting the. Um, you know, uh, the interview request. And um, I'm really happy that uh, uh, you said yes, because you have a lot of fans in India. And really? <laughs> yeah. Send me their names and addresses. Oh, oh well, I must tell you that um, I uh, somebody pinged me, an ex-colleague pinged me from Australia. And he said, oh, please tell him that, you know, and they're Indians, um, they moved to Australia and he said, we love his role as Mr. Mehta on uh, Kim's Convenience. Please tell him that. And I said, I will. Excellent. <laughs> so <laughs> you do have a lot of fans here. Um, I'm not sure, you know, if you're aware of that or not. But yeah. Uh, I, you know, other than my cousins, I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. No, you do. You do. Uh, so just uh, as more people are joining in, I can see, I'm just going to give a brief introduction uh, to Sushit Burgess in case you guys are not you know, aware of uh, anything more than his work on Kim's Convenience and Transplant. He is an award-winning screenwriter, playwright, actor, and director. Um, he, has act he has credits in over 100 films. Uh, I'm just going to, you know, give a very short synopsis of his bio. Uh, credits in, um, you know, 100 credits in films, TV programs, over 25 radio dramas, many stage appearances. Um, and I think uh, some of those uh, plays... Um, uh, I do want to mention because I think it's important uh, because I, you know, I was very intrigued by some of the work you've done on stage. Um, uh, the plays include Anu Shri Roy's play Little Pretty in the Exceptional. You got a Dora nomination, Dora Award nomination for Outstanding Performance. And I think that was, that was brilliant. Um, and also uh, you've done a lot of stuff related to some stuff related to kids, I think. You know, you did the Muppet series. So that, that again, you know, the, fra uh, the Fraggle Rock, which I think is great. You've also done the crime drama, Blue Murder. Um, and oh, these are writing. This is, this is writing that you're talking about writing. now. Yeah, this is yeah. writing. And your documentary credits, which again is writing. Um, uh, you've co-written the IMAX film Lost Worlds, Life in the Balance, narrated by Harrison Ford, which I think was brilliant, uh, by the way. Um, you've also won a Writers Guild of uh, uh, Canada award for the um, animated scripts for the NFB, uh, NFB's Tale Spinners collection. You've won the first York Trillium Award for Most Promising Writer Television. But then now you're not most promising. You've won more awards than that. I mean, you Oh, I'm still hoping for my big break. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> well, okay. you know, this, it's, uh, it's Canada. I, I'm based in Canada, so... Um, <laughs> You know, being in the arts in Canada is like being in witness protection. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, it's not I, by the way, he's joining us from Canada. Um, so, you know, due to the time difference, it's 10 o'clock in the morning, and it was very nice of him to, you know, get up and uh, get this. Drag out of bed and get my. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, great. And also, he's listed in the who's who in Canada, which I think is very important, right? Um, because I've never had a who's who guest and given that you're a who's who, you know, you're on the list of who's who in Canada. That's like brilliant. Um, of course, it's also due to the extensive uh, accomplishments, you know, in all the fields that you're in. Uh, so thank you so much again, so, uh, you know, once again for um, uh, joining me. Uh, but I do want to ask you, do you, do you come to India at all? Um, or, you know, have you ever visited any time recently? Uh, not recently. I was there for my cousin's wedding 10, 15 years ago was the last time. So, uh, okay. uh, I, you know, I'm due for, <clears throat> due for a visit. 
um, you know, I was born in Kerala, but most of my family is now spread out from from Kerala. Uh, I have family in um, Chennai and Mumbai, and then Singapore. You know, there we're all we're all Indians. We're all over, right? So <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a big it's a big world trip you have to make. Yeah, that's true. Um, so uh, so I you know there were some key questions I wanted to ask you, and um, I thought it'd be great. Uh, to have uh, somebody of your repute, you know, to chat about this uh, and about your work as well, because, uh, you know, very accomplished person of Indian origin, um, you know, in Canada. And I think uh, that lends, um, you know, to, to showcase the talent that people do have, you know, East Asians have, and they can make it big um, in, you know, the US or Canada. Uh, so I think that's very important. And you're probably an idol for a lot of people, um, especially like... I don't know about an idol, but definitely in the Canadian entertainment world, I'm a pioneer. You yeah. Know, when, I, when I started, and I've, I've celebrated my uh, 40th anniversary of breaking into Canadian television as a writer last November. Oh, um, congratulations. I, was, I, I had no role models. There was nobody like me. So I think I'm definitely a pioneer. Okay, so I, and I think that's great because you forged the path for so many people um, and you've shown that what, you know, it can be achieved with if you have the talent and of course you work hard. Um, so uh, my first question to you is, um, you know, I saw a couple of posts where you put up uh, on Insta about Black Lives Matter. So given that, you know, the COVID pandemic has kind of, this is what the world is under lockdown, so to speak, only now we're kind of getting out of it. We still need a vaccine. Um, but now, you know, unfortunately, we see the Black Lives Matter movement, which has erupted again. This is not the first time it has happened in the U.S. It's happened over the years. Um, so as a person of South Asian descent, how important do you think this issue of racism is? And have you ever pers you know, personally faced it at all in your life? Well, I think uh, the issue of racism is, is uh, so critical for us to accept, acknowledge, uh, uh, respect. And, you know, the problem is that it, it, up till now, tends to have gotten dismissed. Oh, there's no, especially in Canada. Oh, there's no racism in Canada. We're a nice country. Uh, you know, America, they had slavery. Canada wasn't like that. But, you know, it's obviously, that's ridiculous. You know, Canada has as much racism as many countries. You know, the story that I tell is, uh, Indian people have been coming to Canada since 1905. Black people have been coming, you know, have been in Canada since 18, you know, 1700s. Uh, Chinese people since uh, 1880s, and so on and so forth. But as a kid being educated in the Canadian education system, you weren't educated that way. You, you were educated that this was a, uh, a French and English country with maybe some conquering a First Nation people. And so uh, your sense of belonging as a non-white uh, citizen, as a non-white person, gets frayed, gets, uh, you know, screwed up. And, and I grew up, you know, desperately as an only brown kid in my school, in my little town in, you know, Canada, wanting to belong and knowing that I wasn't somehow able to in the way that my my white friends were. And it goes back to that fundamental question of belonging. So Black Lives Matter to me is just uh, dealing with that issue on a much more extreme uh, uh, basis. We obviously have to uh, support, I mean, my, my colleagues who are black, they have faced tremendous discrimination in, in our industry. When you ask me if I have, I mean, overt, um, you know, people yelling at me on the street or something, no, but I have faced discrimination, of course. You know, uh, uh, my career, uh, I was um, certainly early on, you know, I was only uh, able to be uh, considered if the role was written for an Indian character. And how many movies and plays and TV shows were written with the Indian character there? There weren't any. So I ended up being a writer and I wrote those characters so that I could then play them in the, in the, uh, on screen. Uh, 
Now, happily, we have reached a point after 40 years of struggle, certainly in the Canadian context of demanding diversity in casting and diversity in representation, that uh, we are not necessarily having to play only the Indian guy. Uh, we can play the guy. Do you want? Do you know what I mean? And uh, and I think that's what we're seeing with with um, with uh, the success of these shows that I'm in now, uh, Kim's Convenience, which has now come to India and trans in uh, Netflix. And I'm also on the number one drama in Canadian television this season, which is called Transplant, which is a hospital show where I play an Indian doctor who's grown up in Canada. His name is Ajay Singh. Uh, and I, I look and sound like I'm talking to you now. I don't have a, an accent because he's not an immigrant character. So that, that's you know, the progress that, that we've made, but we're seeing that there's so much more to do. And as South Asians in uh, the West, uh, you know, I feel completely uh, uh, um, supportive of, uh, of the Black Lives Matter uh, movement because you know, my friends are at, uh, their lives are at stake. Right, right, right. I think that's important. And racism, I think, or discrimination, um, there are so many forms of it. I mean, even in India, um, you know. Um, Colorism? So, there is discrimination. I mean, we have a lot of that as well here. Uh, but in different forms, not so much as color, but in other ways, you know. Um, well, I so mean, that, that's the thing, you know, that what the Black Lives Matter movement has shown is that... Um, we can't ignore our, um, you know, our uh, family. This is a family. We're a family of, of humans. And how can you say, okay, that person is less, that member of my family is less human than, than I am. It's ridiculous. Right, right. I come, yes, I, I agree with you. Um, you mentioned your two shows, uh, of course, Kim's Convenience, which is now on Netflix. And like I said, it's gained a lot of popularity. And of course, Transplant, which we don't have access to yet, but I'm hoping that it comes on one of the OTT platforms and, you know, people here get to Well, we it. just, um, we're one of the first uh, Canadian shows ever to be picked up by NBC, which is, yeah. of course, the big U.S. primetime network. Uh, right. So that's very exciting. And hopefully that will trigger uh, some kind of uh, international sales. Yeah. Uh, but both those shows also deal with immigrants, right? Because yes, kids, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So that's a very interesting um, angle. I mean, that the fact that uh, there are two successful shows and they uh, they deal with immigrants. So it shows that diversity, I mean, it's being more accepted in mainstream, um, you know, in mainstream television series, if I could call it that, right? Well, I've been kicking that can as an artist uh, creatively for a long time and I'm glad that in my professional life we see that uh, immigrant stories, diversity uh, has become mainstream. It's not a one of, it's not a, oh, let's do, you know, when I started it was an, uh, I was probably the writer and star of the very first sort of immigrant multicultural romantic comedy movie that CBC ever made, which is one of the second things I ever did 35 years ago. And then, but that was like a one of it was it was done and it was an exception. And then, you know, we go back to the old type of programs with Victorian characters all speaking in British accents, you know. Uh, uh, now, it, you, you probably would have a tough time uh, trying to sell a TV show, at least in uh, North America, without a, a character who's who's, uh, you know, a diverse character or south asian or chinese or whatever but but american or canadian too i mean that would be a very difficult uh, sale to make so uh and what that says to me is that we are acknowledging who the audience really is our audience is diverse mm. you know we are not just a one people we are a diverse community whether it's in canada or globally it's a diverse right. and uh and, and in order to to reflect that audience I mean, I've been saying this for 35 years, in order to reflect that audience and, and capture that audience, we need to see them on screen. Right. And, and now we're finally seeing them on screen without having to apologize for that. I think that's wonderful. Um, 
uh, and like i mentioned you know it's on netflix and given that you have amazon prime and netflix picking up a lot of the us shows the canadian shows worldwide you know even um, uh, money heist and things like that you know yeah. from there so uh, what's what these ott platforms have done is given a global audience right so now you have fans like i told you like in india in australia i mean so isn't that exciting for you as an artist as a writer well uh, what's really exciting is that um first of all the, the we're reaching those people immediately i've been on shows in the past that travel that got international sales and you would see the list oh sold to brazil sold to india sold to china but you never got a you knew those fans now with social media the fans get a hold of you you yeah. know <laughs> and and i i i actually know some of them uh, personally i mean i at least their twitter handles so uh that's really exciting i mean i mentioned you know i have cousins in india and they've never seen much of the work i've done now they're seeing it uh, shortly after our, it's shown in canada it's it's okay. tremendous um you're an award winning uh, screenwriter um so how much do you enjoy the process of screen you know of writing um and how did you actually get started because you mentioned that you know you uh, you were getting roles um you know and therefore you started writing your uh, writing roles that suited um uh, you know well i never really planned to be an actor okay uh, i just wanted i just wanted to break into the film and tv business somehow and okay. i didn't i didn't have a uncle who was a film producer and i didn't have a movie camera and this okay. is a long time ago when movie cameras were $50,000 anyway they okay. didn't give you an image half as good as your phone does now but that was then and uh all i had was a typewriter so i decided well the way i can break in somehow is to write something um it's a very naive idea but that's what i did uh and mm -hmm. uh I wrote this little script that then got me a chance to submit an idea for a show at CBC and uh that's how I started writing. So I never planned to be an actor. What happened was as I mentioned this second drama that I did for CBC which was this multicultural uh, romantic comedy uh we couldn't find an actor. I mean he had to be an Indo-Canadian type of character. Uh uh we couldn't find an actor because there weren't any back then. and the film was going to get canceled so i begged them to let me audition for my mm -hmm. own movie and i they did and i got the part and that's how i started acting and okay. since then i have had a sort of parallel careers as a writer and i've written a lot of television i wrote for the muppets i wrote i was one of the original writers for the fraggle rock tv series which went all over the world and worked with jim henson and all that stuff uh and i wrote a lot of canadian television Occasionally I would get a chance to write something that I ended up acting in as well. Like you mentioned the show Blue Murder. I wrote uh it was actually about um uh it had South Asian themes in it that one episode anyway that I wrote and I wrote myself a guest starring part. <laughs> you know, <laughs> why not? Yeah, that's great. I mean, you you're quite talented. I mean, not just as a writer, but even as an actor and I think you started getting um more diverse roles and uh lengthier parts i mean you became critical crucial to the show uh whether it's kims or um you know even <clears throat> but when i started the best parts i had were the ones i wrote for myself oh okay <laughs> <laughs> and and then the parts i was getting was you know i was the doctor i mean right. i got played maybe 25 tv doctors i could cut a <laughs> i could cut a reel of my doctors to them stars you know <laughs> telling them they got cancer or whatever uh but um but now i'm lucky enough to have have been given some really good roles and it's it's great right uh theater seems to be one of your passions isn't it um because uh, uh you uh you're a playwright as well you act on stage as well and uh, i i did my undergraduate degree in theater right i i wasn't really planning on having a career in theater and you know and this is because you're a kid you don't know really what how to have a career in the arts uh right. and i really started in television but i did have that theater background and when the chance came up you know an indian character in a play they asked me to audition and uh so i've i've also had a a career in the theater since uh you know about 35 years now um 
I, I have to say, unlike television, theater is even more restrictive in Canada. And I was expected to only, you know, it was it was only if it was a character who was Indian that they wanted me, and I had to have an accent usually, and some famous plays. You know, I was in Tom Stoppard's Indian Ink at uh, the great, you know, big Can Stage National Arts Center production um, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and, and it was those kinds of plays that I got a chance to do as an actor. Uh, it's only recently that I, I finally got to play a non-accented, non-Indian character on on stage. You know, it took 40 years for me to, to get that chance. So those are the kinds of discriminations that I'm talking about. Right. It's not overt, you know, uh, attacking racism per se, but it is it is a form of racism that we have to we I had to live with and learn to cope with in trying to survive in a career in the arts. I, I I like to think that we have reached the point where that is over, that era is over, um, and we'll see. I mean, the Black Lives Matter movement has pointed out we've got a long way to go. Right, uh, but do you think the advent of technology? Uh, it's going to be, you know, challenging for theaters to survive, or do you think theater is going to evolve? <laughs> See, the problem is that now with the COVID, a lot of live performance, I mean, it's over. People can't go to live, see live performance. Um, and theaters, particularly the ones that I'm affiliated with, have had to resort to uh, streaming uh, and Zooming uh, content to, to just say relevant and current and alive in the minds of an audience out there. I, I think it's a temporary stopgap measure until we figure out how to have a new normal of, of performing arts in, in a post-COVID world. And I don't know what that's going to look like because I don't think theater is on, on online. You know, theater right. is fundamentally an actor and an mm -hmm. audience in the room together live. And if you don't have that, you don't have theater. You might have something, it could be art. You, maybe the Zoom monologue streaming into your uh, uh, co uh, computer is, is very arti artistic, but it's okay. not theater. And, uh, and there's, you know, I, I always say that every show I've been in, <clears throat> every performance is different. And it's not different because of me. I'm doing the same play every night. It's different because of the audience. Every audience is different. I always say, well, I can pick that audience out of a police lineup each one of them. I know the guy in the fifth row. I, and that guy in the twelfth row coughing every time I have a good line. I know all of them. And, and so that audience actor relationship is the fundamental to what theater is. And without that, we don't have theater. And that's what I'm worried about uh, going forward. Right. Um, but how much of creative satisfaction do you get, um, you know, acting, uh, whether on stage or on television? Um, uh, you know, versus writing, um, do you find acting more creatively satisfying? See, I work as a writer, I work as an actor, I work as a director, I work as an editor. Uh, and, and the one thing I would say is, after doing it for 40 years, it's the same job. Okay. And if I could put the profession on my passport, it would be storyteller. And, and what writing is, is storytelling on paper. Uh, what directing is, is storytelling behind the camera or using the camera. Uh, acting is storytelling in front of the camera. Editing is storytelling after the camera finishes. Uh, and if you don't understand what storytelling is, you can't do any of those jobs. If you do understand storytelling, uh, you know, there's other skill sets that you need to be an actor versus a writer. But without that skill set of understanding story, you can't do the job. So that to me is is why I have been able to uh, do all of those jobs is because my approach is that of a storyteller and my job is to be the storyteller and I'm just using a different muscle depending on what, uh, uh, where in the storytelling process I, I'm at. Right. But do you wish to, I mean, having you know, been a pioneer in the work that you've done in Canada and having been doing this for 40 years. Do you wish to see any changes in the arts in the future? Well, you know, the, there's political changes that I think we need to have. And, and many of them have happened recently. Um, you know, uh, uh, 
so many more women uh, are active in, in the arts. In television in Canada, uh, uh, the CBC, which is our public broadcaster, requires that 50% of all directors are now have to be women. And on Kim's Convenience, all of them are women, except for one, uh, one, one guy. Um, uh, so we're way over the quota. And so I think that those kinds of initiatives are more and more important. You know, I, I said I've been kicking this diversity can down the road for a long time. And I know that sadly, sadly asking nicely doesn't work, mm. right? We have to actually say, no, you are required to put a, a non-white character in your show. You're required to put mm. a non-white writer in the room. You're required to have a woman director because, uh, you know, that's how systemic racism is in our societies. I don't care where you are. They are they're systemic everywhere. So the racist and sexist and frankly ageist. Um, and, and so I think those types of initiatives that combat those mm -hmm. systemic forms of discrimination, that's going to be uh, necessary going forward. Otherwise we're going to be having these same conversations and uh, the next generation is just gonna come up against the same uh, uh, issues I did. Right. Um, but throughout your career, uh, was it smooth sailing for you or did you face any challenges at all? Other than the discrimination, I'm saying. You know, I, I, you know, I don't want to say that discrimination was my big challenge. I mean, a career in the yeah. arts, a career in the arts is tough. There's, hmm. there's no question. And, and uh, uh, you know, there are people who can have a career because they're, the camera likes them, but that will only go so far, you know, as long as the camera likes them. But after right. you get a point a certain age, you may not be so attractive on camera. If you want to have a career in the arts, you have to be somebody who, yes, the camera likes or the audience likes or whatever, but you also have to have the training and the skill and the, and the ability to have something to say going forward throughout your career. Um, so, you know, that's, that's really what I've tried to bring to the party. And I think that's why I've survived. Uh, uh, um, you know, I have a lot of talented friends who don't work as much as I do. Uh, you know, talent is a prerequisite, but it's not going to have, have a career. You know, you really have to have um, a lot of things that, and, and, and frankly, luck, luck is so, so important and and so to to the talented people who aren't lucky i say it's not your fault you know lucky luck is unfortunately an aspect of success in the arts too but you have to adapt yourself and evolve uh with time as well as age isn't it i think that's very important to survive in the arts well and and that's why i'm kind of the poster boy for diversification as a key to survival in the arts so mm -hmm. You know, if I'm if I'm out of work or I'm I'm not able to get work as an actor, I'm writing. You know, right. and hopefully something that I'm writing is going to pay the bills somehow as well. I mean, it's it's being able to have a career in the arts. I mean, most of my colleagues who have thrived are not just one trick ponies. Everybody is creating their own work or their writing, you know, Anusri uh, Roy, you mentioned who wrote this wonderful play that I was in, Little Pretty and the Exceptional. She also writes television. You know, right. if she's not just trying to make a living as a playwright. She's a television writer. She's also an actress. She was in the Stratford Company, which is Canada's most prestigious Shakespearean theater company. She's been in their company, mm -hmm. you know, so and she's a South Asian Canadian. Uh, uh, so, so that's what it takes to survive. You, you have to adapt, you have to diversify and you can't rely on your, your looks, uh, to keep you employed. Okay. So, um, what are you working on next? Well, uh, you know, this is a tough question given the, what we're facing with COVID. I mean, I was in rehearsal for a play at one of Canada's big theaters, uh, uh, and it was a Chekhov play that we sh got shut down just uh, because of COVID. We were just about to go into our final technical rehearsal before we opened. Uh, and had, a, had this been a normal time, I'd be filming season five of Kim's Convenience right now, 
and hopefully season two of Transplant. We haven't heard about that yet, but it's the number one show, so I'm I'm keeping my fingers crossed. And all of that's suspended indefinitely. Um, so what do we work on now when you don't know if there's going to be a, an industry? Uh, I'm writing. You know, I'm writing a, a, a movie, uh, hopefully that uh, will lead to something. The problem is, of course, the movie is set in the hospital, and I have no idea what a hospital is <laughs> going to be like post-COVID. So I don't know if I'm writing a period piece set in 2019. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to stay uh, active and positive uh, in this time, and, um, and we'll see what happens. Okay, okay, that's great. Um, so my last question to you is screenwriter, director, you know, actor, playwright, which is the role you cherish the most? I know you said that, you know, you're a storyteller and it's just different formats, but there must be some, uh, you know, one of these roles that you really cherish a little more. Oh, uh, directing is the most fun. Okay, okay. No Why is that? Uh, well, because <clears throat> you're, you're, it's like a, you um, you get to play with all of these amazing people uh, creating something that is basically um, your vision. Uh, hopefully it's your vision. Uh, when I work as an actor, I'm only responsible for my character. Uh, when I'm working as a writer, I am hope writing something that hopefully will work, but I have to let it go. And uh, oh, the director gets to have all the fun making it happen. Uh, so, so that would be, you know, that's what I, what I enjoy the most. It's kind of the hardest job to get, uh, but, um, but yeah, I, that's my favorite. But I, I, I have to say, I don't complain if I'm working in any of those jobs, really. I, I love acting. I love writing. I mean, writing is the hardest, believe me. Uh, I love directing, and I and and don't tell the producers this, but I would do any of them for free if they didn't pay me. Um, but but uh, and, and because my approach is so holistic, I think you know when I work as an actor, my mentality is, oh, the director's working for me, the 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 crew is working for me, and their job is to make me do you know look really good. So right. so you know it, it 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 I bring that to it, so it's not so bad. Uh, but if you're asking which is the job I like the most, uh, directing is. Okay, so you said your family, you know, they're all doctors and you're the exception. What do they think about you now, you know, given that you decided to take a completely different route and you've made it big? Well, my, my you know, Indian family were all doctors. My father was a neurosurgeon. Uh, my grandfather was a doctor. Uh, I had an uncle who was a doctor, two cousins who were doctors. Um, I think when I turned 30, you know, my dad, my dad always wanted me to be a heart surgeon. And uh, when I turned 30, he apparently turned to my mother and he said, uh, oh, he'd just be finishing his residency now. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't in, in medicine. But then when I, the last time I came to India, I, I stayed with my dad's first cousin. They were the same age. And right. he said to me one day, my dad's first cousin, he says, you know, when your father was a boy, he wanted to be a film star. Oh, wow. So I went, aha, <laughs> aha. So, you know, on some level, uh, my family has been very supportive. Uh, okay. I think what they just, and, and I've had enough success early on and throughout that they, you know, they went, okay, maybe this is going to work out. Um, uh, so, I, you know, they've been very supportive and they've been very proud. They don't quite understand how I can make a living doing this. Right. Uh, you know, because I don't go in and punch a time clock and then get a check at the end of the day or whatever. But uh, but but yeah, no, they're they're uh, they're a real asset to uh, it. Would, it's much harder if you don't have a supportive family. Okay. And I do. That, that's wonderful. So thank you so much for joining me. Um, it's been a pleasure. Lada. It's uh, it's great. I'm so <laughs> thrilled to talk to you in uh, India. And, and uh, where are you uh, actually physically located? I'm physically located in Chennai. Ah, so you can say hello to my cousin. Say hello <laughs> to my cousin. He lives there. Okay, definitely. And how are, um, you know, things are okay where you live, right? Uh, as far as COVID is concerned? I mean, I just want to make sure. That uh, yeah, I live in downtown Toronto. So it's okay. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's fine. I mean, we, 
you can go out and go you do your grocery shopping. I wear a mask when I right. go out. Um, you know, uh, our our death rate and our case rate is higher than I would like for a country of our size, but it's so much less than the U.S. And we're so right. close to U.S. that I feel reasonably grateful for that. Um, and and you know, parts of the country are now reopening. Um, it's really only the hot spots are are where I live in in Toronto and in in Quebec, which is the French uh, or bilingual province. Um, so, you know, uh, yeah, all, all is reasonably okay. And um, we're just trying to stay safe. Okay, that's great. I'm sure things will settle in the, in the next six months. I think things will settle and hopefully we'll have a vaccine by then. I mean, that's what the world is hoping for. Well, who knows? I mean, we've had uh, AIDS for 40 years and we still don't have a vaccine. So, you know, I think we'll, we, we might have a, some kind of cures. We might have a lot of things. But... I think we also, and I feel like I have to prepare for a, a world where we are living with COVID as a as a reality. But so we're going to be making lifestyle adjustments in order to deal with that. Yeah. And I just hope that, you know, those lifestyle ad adjustments don't affect. I mean, already life as we know it has changed. I'm just hoping that, you know, um, it's not so drastic going forward and things get better for everybody. I think we all need it at this point. Uh, thank you so much, Sujit, for joining me. And My pleasure. Thank you. And I hope you had a fun chat. I mean, I learned much more about you than no, obviously that was the whole intention because um, I was so keen that, you know, I just, I found you on Twitter and I was like, I have to talk to him. You know, he's... Well, I'm, I'm <laughs> thrilled that you reached out. I'm so glad we could have this chat. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'll be in touch for sure. Thank All you right. so much for joining me. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Guys, bye.